Thank you, Joe and Rafi and Paul. Um, <laughs> here are my disclosures. So I'm going to try to answer why, uh, what is lateralization reverse in six minutes and how it's measured. And this feels like an episode of Unsolved Mystery where we're trying to identify the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, but in reality, it's actually fairly boring, it's math. And um, where it comes down to is that there are various lateralization measurements that we have. You can measure on the implant side, either measuring the glenoid alone or the humerus alone or globally, or you can measure clinically. And this can be in two dimensions, either using distance or an angle, or in three dimensions, using distance and using some computer software program. I'm gonna try to explain these to you and then give you a strategy as to how to use these. So the first thing to identify is what's the difference between implant and clinical lateralization. Implant lateralization is the amount of lateralization that's provided by the implant in reference to another position on the implant. Uh, J.D. Werthel's reported these several years ago for various implant companies. Clinical lateralization is the amount of global lateralization that's provided when the implant is actually placed in a shoulder. Uh, so here are some schematics just describing these. You see on the left, implant lateralization, how much is provided by the implant alone, whereas clinical lateralization, how much is provided when the implant is placed with inside the shoulder. So let's look at glenoid side and humeral side. So glenoid implant lateralization, we know that there are various effects including, uh, that, can, uh, uh, that lateralization has, including increasing sphere size, base plate augmentation, bone grafting. There are two ways to measure. It's the distance from the face of the glenoid to the center of rotation of the glenosphere, or distance of the face of the glenoid to the deepest portion of the articular surface. My preference is to use the former, and you can group them into medial or lateralized glenoids based upon five millimeters. Let's look at humeral implant lateralization. Howard Routman on the stage uh, described this for us, and you can, he was able to break them down into either medialized or lateralized humeral components. We know a 135 neck shaft angle, a curved stem, an onlay implant can increase your humeral lateralization. There's two ways to measure this. The first is from the distance of the center of the stem to the center of the cut surface or to the deepest portion of the articular surface. And for me, I, I like the latter because, again, you can break these down into medialized or lateralized designs based on 15 millimeters, and you can determine global lateralization. So what's global implant lateralization? It is what it is and what it sounds like. It's from the center of the stem to the face of the uh, base plate. And then you can group them based upon either a medialized or lateralized glenoid design or medialized or lateralized humeral design. Okay, so what's clinical lateralization? This is when it's placed in the shoulder. So you can measure this on two dimensions by distance, and this is the lateral humeral offset. It takes into account the impl implant being placed in the humerus or in the bone. It's a measure of global lateralization, so both the glenoid and humeral side, and it's the distance from the lateral aspect of the acromion to the lateral aspect of the greater tuberosity. And Gilles Walsh and Brigitte uh, Warner uh, originally described this back in 2017. So you can also measure this using an angle measurement. This is the lateral shoulder angle. This takes the angle from the superior pole of the glenoid to the lateral aspect of the acromion to the lateral aspect of the greater tuberosity. Again, it's a measure of global lateralization, but in reality, I'm not gonna get into this because it's really for research purposes only. Finally, there's 3D lateralization. So this is virtual and still takes into account the actual implant being placed inside the bone. So for me, this is a measure of true clinical lateralization. It is a global measure, and, it, and how it's uh, defined is a point is identified on the native proximal humerus in three dimensions at the center of the cut, and then the same point is identified on the final postoperative plan in three dimensions, and you measure the global lateralization. And in this case, you can see it's four millimeters. We know there are various effects of implant or glenoid lateralization, including improved stability, reduced notching, improved range of motion. We also know that there are various effects of humeral implant lateralization, including improved deltoid wrap. Uh, Howard's taught us about posterior cuff moment arms. George has taught us about torque in the posterior rotator cuff and decreasing acromial strains. Uh, we also know that there's an optimal glenoid lateralization in terms of range of motion theoretically. Jay has shown us probably somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters of glenoid lateralization is optimal. And similarly, in terms of optimal global clinical lateralization, this has been identified using lateral humeral offset. Albert Lin has recently published that he's shown that external rotation improvement is better if global lateralization is back to pre-op or greater, meaning that the global lateralization is zero or greater.
So how do you put it all together? For me, measuring implant glenoid lateralization, face of the glenoid, center of rotation. Implant lateralization on the humerus, middle of the humerus to the center of the articulation. Clinical lateralization, lateral humeral offset in two dimensions or 3D. And then my initial goals for clinical lateralization are to bring the glenoid back about five to 10 millimeters and the global lateralization either in 2D or 3D should be back to baseline, so zero or greater. And then what I do is change the glenoid or humeral implant lateralization to customize to the patient based on their age, gender, size, instability, fracture risk, understanding the impact or effects of, clinic, of imp implant lateralization either on the glenoid or humeral side on each of these factors. Thank you. Uh, we, we need to distill a very difficult topic into something everyone can understand. Thank you, Bob. Uh, judges, we'll start with, um, let's see, Evan. Joe, you keep starting with me every time. Um, Bob, excellent. Uh, you know, it is difficult, I think, that using the face of the glenoid after we reaming it as a reference, I, I'm challenged by that uh, and continue to be. Um, I, I think you distilled that information very, very well and took, made a very boring topic uh, uh, basically understandable. So. Thank you. Eight, because there's no ten. <laughs> Paul. Uh, uh, amazing review of the, uh, of the literature. I'd like to hear that talk about six more times, and then maybe six more times after that to really completely understand uh, all the clinical implications. Uh, remarkably well done. Uh, ten. Wesley. Uh, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a 10, but I have a question. Do you have global lateralization in mind? Do you, do you care where you get it relative to complication risk, meaning lateral humeral offset or getting it from the glenoid? What's your sweet spot? Yeah, so I think that where it then comes down to the impact of varying the implant lateralization and so what you're trying to achieve. So in that last slide, so if I have a small female osteoporotic, I'm gonna go less lateral on the glenoid side and maybe more lateral on the humeral side. Whereas if I have a young male obese patient that's having a revision, I know the likelihood for having a fracture, a chromal fracture is low, but instability is high. So I'm gonna go as la lateral as I can on the glenosphere with probably not so much worry about actually lateralization on the humerus. Yeah, uh, Bob, great presentation. I, I think uh, you, you really did a great job dis describing humeral side of uh, lateralization. My question to you is the most challenging patients that I experience or see are patients with glenoid erosions. And how do you decide what your start point is for both clinical uh, and actually implant based lateralization? on a patient with glenoid lateralization, or sorry, in a patient with glenoid erosion. Yeah. You know, it's challenging, especially when you start planning, and that's, again, I think Gilles ha and Pascal have made this point that you see things that you never realized that you would be seeing until you start planning. And that if you look at the amount of medialization that can occur in your starting position in some of these B2s, B3s, it can be 20 millimeters. It's massive. And so then it's like, do you bring them all the way back out to zero? I think that's what your question is. No, but how do you, how do you determine what zero is in a person with sure. an erosion? That's my question. Yeah, so, so, where, 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 do, yeah, so where do I think is that you have to take it from what that patient's deformity is, not necessarily what their pre-morbid anatomy is. Because otherwise, if you take it from their pre-morbid anatomy, you're going to be lateralizing 40 millimeters in a patient, and which is probably going to be compromising that patient with all the things on that last slide. So for me, it's their, their pre-morbid state. I'm actually feeling I might be wrong here because Pascal is coming to the podium, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Not at all. I just want to compliment you for this uh, very nice talk with uh, a lot of data. Just want to <clears throat> mention that uh, it's very difficult to uh, speak about lateralization with, without speaking of inclination, mm -hmm. because it's only recent for the last years that we are really uh, having a reference plan 
uh, with the re uh, reversal angle. Be before we were taking the beta angle, which was different. So that's why also changing the numeral inclination at 130, 135 is okay. But if you are really neutral on the glenoid side, I'm not sure it's the best uh, motion that you can obtain. And finally, you mentioned the, the study where the goal was to reproduce the lateralization of the initial uh, shoulder. Mm -hmm. But number one, these are pathologic shoulders, so they are often medalized. And number two, if you do that, at least in my experience, you see sometimes impingement with the acromion, because as you know, in cuff tear arthritis, you have bone on the top of the greater tuberosity, and you have uh, the acromion, which is osteophytic. So then you are facing uh, anterosuper impingement with your uh, reverse mm -hmm. prosthesis. Did you, did you see that in your experience? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I've, uh, you bring up great points. So in Albert's study, the last study that was there that was published, he was specifically looking at the delta between pre and post op LHO. So he wasn't looking at bringing back to pre-morbid state and lateralized to the pre-morbid state, or meaning uneroded state. He was looking at from pre-op where there's significant medialization to post-op to see what the change is. So many of these patients still had a negative LHO. It's just that, meaning if it, it, was, it was the delta in LHO that he was looking at. Um, with regards to impingement, 100%. So uh, now moving to an inlay stem with less distalization. Typical distalization for me is 20 to 30 millimeters using PERFORM, whereas historically with a Grammont implant, it was 30 to 40 millimeters of distalization. Um, impingement now occurs. And then it's how do you manage that? So for me, I've, if that occurs, I'll use an eccentric sphere. I'll try that first to basically get more distalization. I'll go to a 145 instead of 135 neck shaft angle. I'll potentially do a tuberoplasty, and I have switched the stem out to an Aquella stem to a 155, and as soon as you do that, it all goes away. Great job. That was a great discussion. Thank you so much.